ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Wrestle Plug podcast. I'm Aaron Nix, as you know, and I'm joined today by someone very special, arguably the dirtiest man in all of professional wrestling, Arthur Ric Flair, of course. It's a toss up, really. It doesn't, I mean, they're both very charismatic, let's just say. Very. That. I'm joined by the legend that is Dirty Dave Dennis. How you doing, bruv? I mean, you're close, you're close, but you've done it wrong. It's the man, the myth, the future legend, Dirty Dave Dennis, baby, yeah. The eight-time dirty 24-7 champion. But you were close. I, I was close. I was close. Ultimately, yeah. I, I mean, I, I bow in the face of your incredible charisma, sir. Now, uh, Dirty Dave Dennis, you've mentioned the 24-7 championship. You've got it right there. It's a glorious piece of gold. Let's be honest. It's the best-looking belt much. in the business. So let's start with something very simple. Only an eight-time champion, which would suggest you're very good at defending it, not like that pretender our truth on the WWE brand. Now, talk exactly. to me. Talk to me about the belt and the lineage of the dirty 24-7 championship. Well, I'll, I'll come out of character for a sec, if you don't mind. What? <laughs> um, character? If, well, yeah, you know, Dirty Dave is me. I am Dirty Dave. It's one in the yeah. same. But but uh, the, the truth of the matter was, uh, it's one of them things. Uh, I'm never going to be uh, have a five-star Dave Milton match, I don't think, anyway. Um, so you have to start thinking, what have I got different to everyone else? Yeah. And as I was going out to shows and stuff, um, it was a rumble I was in, Revolution Rumble, 30-man rumble. And it had people from all over the place, you know, Johnny Storm, Jody Flies, really good wrestlers in there, as well as Ref Pro's guys. And I went out there in the middle of the rumble and done a floss. And it got just as big reaction as everything that come before it. So it proved to me that the entertainment factor is one thing I am naturally good at, mm. you know. I, in the real world, I own a computer game shop. So I deal with young kids and stuff all the time. So I knew the floss was in because of Fortnite. So it, it, it sort of links to that. So the Dirty 24-7 title came to, I was in a car going to Milton Keynes um, for a seminar with a few of the guys. And I was talking and I came up with the idea because I'd done holiday camps, quite a few of them, of the Dirty 24-7 title. Because not only can you defend it in the ring, you can defend it outside the ring, it's just another way of going about stuff to sort of get me out there. And it's an easy booking, really, for a promoter because you don't have to think. You can put Dirty Dave defends his 24-7 title and you don't know who's going to show up to face me. And I just thought it was something completely different. Yeah, it's got a... I, I like it. It's got a great vibe. It's it's like the 24-7 title, but it's got its own edge. And that's what's important about it. It's not just a, a rip-off, so to speak. It is its own entity. And it very much makes you up as well it's part of your personality it's part of who you are which is why it's so important and obviously it's going to be a focal point the word dirty is obviously going to be an incredible focal point at what point do we start training do we start wrestling and think do you know what i'm just a little bit more dirty than the rest of these people well i'm 41 years old which a lot of people don't realize so i'm a bit older than your average trainee and i started training about four four and a half years ago mm. uh uh, Rev Pro and there's a story of um, I went to an NXT event and Drew McIntyre and Asuka were doing an autograph signing so I went and got their autograph and I was ch chatting to Drew McIntyre and I said about wrestling training and he said he trained in Portsmouth and I live on the Isle of Wight and he was telling me that he used to come all the way from Scotland to Portsmouth to training and I was always sort of made an excuse that I'm on the Isle of Wight it's too far to go to training Hmm. After hearing that, I Googled it, and the very next week, they were starting a Monday session for new newbies, basically. Uh, so I went along to that, and it was uh, Rishi Ghosh, and it was Dan McGee doing the training there. And that's how I got into it. And it was just one thing that, it was a really good, I'd say, not too pressured way of doing it, I thought. You know, um, I, I, you know the whole thing of a newbie coming in and having to do a thousand bumps and they'll never come back again. I don't see the point of. Hmm. It was more very gradual, gradual. I thought both guys were good at training in different ways. Um, but no, I really enjoyed it. Um, it. It was a bit of an issue as far as I'd literally leave the house eight o'clock in the morning, go to work all day, um, go to train him and not get back to midnight. You know, so the Isle of Wight is a bit of a trek. But as I said, I've been watching wrestling since I'm about five or six years old. So you either want to do it or you don't. And as I say, I was about 37. I thought, well, I'm not getting any, any younger, really. It is literally now or never for me. So I just thought I'd give it a go. 
Yeah, like I, I, I quite respect that because I'm in a similar bite on 36, which you'll probably think is young, but you know, <laughs> I started at 33 and I thought, Jesus. So obviously I've got my own kind of uh, experiences of what it was like starting later and obviously being, you know, chasing around all these fucking young whippersnappers and everything else right. that goes on with this podcast. What was it like for you, that first kind of, first few months of training because obviously whether you're in shape or not obviously most people start at such a young age here you are starting a, an incredibly astute age i always think that you have a little bit more wisdom because you're an older person because you know you've lived a bit more so on that you know you make up for the disadvantage of maybe athleticism or you know cardio for lack of a better term by having a little bit more of a more solid mind for the real world and how to conduct yourself that's how right I it. yeah so, i mean the, the honest truth was in the first few weeks, it fucking hurt. <laughs> my neck, my back, it really, really hurt. Um, and you're right, a lot of the other guys were a lot younger and a lot fitter. Um, and they can do things I'd love to do. Mm. But one thing within, I'd say, a month of training, I was going maybe once, uh, twice a week, because they used to do special seminars, you know, with different wrestlers and stuff like that as well. And within the first couple of weeks, or a month or so, I always had the idea of Dirty Dave in my brain. It was something, it was my nickname in college, truth be told, Dirty Dave. I won't tell you how I got it, because it's nothing to do with wrestling, but being a bit of a lad. And um, yeah, within a few uh, weeks, months, I noticed I had a bit more character. So what you, I didn't have in a natural ability, because I'll hmm. be the, totally honest, I haven't got the natural ability, I never did. It was always a case of how else can I get on a card? How else can I shine out? And being naturally loud in the ring and stuff, I don't, it just came naturally. And I think you're right. I think it's years of watching wrestling. I watched, when I started getting to it, it was Big Boss Man, Hacksaw Jim Duggan, British Bulldog, uh, Repo Man, Berserker, whoever, all big characters. Mm. And nowadays you watch it. So the people that have watched it only 10 years, they all want to be the young bucks or people like that. And to me, it's just a different way of looking at it. Not everyone can be like the young bucks. You know, so you do need on a wrestling card someone a bit different. And that's how I saw it very early on. And it has sort of panned out that way. As it who's, who was your favourite wrestler back in the day? Ah, well, back in the day, I don't know why. As a kid, I loved the Big Boss Man and the British Bulldog. Uh, also the Ultimate Warrior. The Ultimate Warrior was very much, you watch it back now and some people don't get it. Mm. But the whole thing is when his music came on, honestly, as a kid, I used to get so excited just him running to the ring. Adrenaline, mate. Exactly. And his look and everything was what you'd want a wrestler to be, in my book. Uh, in later years, so by the time I was about 20, Kurt Angle, just because matches, you are, oh, I don't think you ever had a bad match, Kurt Angle, until his very later days anyway. But um, if I could be anyone or have a match with anyone, it'd be Kurt Angle, without doubt. Awesome. Okay. I like that because you've answered those questions simply and succinctly. So we don't have to waste too much time banging on about them. Now, obviously, you know, age aside, Dirty Dennis aside, 24-7 championship aside. By the way, there's, there's a clip I've seen of the 24-7 championship being held by Bin. Is that correct? Um, yeah. <laughs> Good stuff. Um, the great O'Khan. The great O'Khan was gifted the Dirty 24-7 champion by Lord Gideon Gray, who illegally choked me out, obviously. Obviously. Um, unfortunately, the great Okan, who is now doing very well for himself in New Japan, threw the belt in the bin and called it a piece of shit. So what I had to do, of course, is pin the bin to get my belt back. Pin the bin. And Please. again, if you watch what's happening in Japan and stuff like that, or in the Indies in America, there's a lot of random stuff now. People know wrestling isn't real. But it's not real. It's scripted, you know. Um, so why try and pretend it is? Why can't you do something a bit different? Yeah, that's my way of looking at it. Yeah, I, I like that, and like it's very evident. Like you've actually been on my radar for quite a while. Obviously, going to Red Pro myself, your name gets thrown around quite a bit as one of the more charismatic lads. Well, I think I don't think it's disrespectful to say that Red Pro focuses on a very athletic orientated style of wrestling and characters there are at a premium and if you look at someone like Curtis Chapman for instance who's now gone into Mad Kurt territory infinitely. he nicked my gimmick yeah he nicked my gimmick I'll give I'll give him that Mad Kurt he nicked my gimmick he started flossing he got over that's fine <laughs> no, seriously seriously so seriously me and Curtis uh we were wrestling on camp shows about three four weeks in a row a Bogner in front of one week it'd be 50 people, one week it'd be two, 300 people. 
and we had different matches. So we didn't have the same match week after week. And we, we naturally clicked, actually. Curtis, I like. I've always liked Curtis. Uh, I always thought he got a raw deal at first as, as you know, a super contender. Yeah. And ever since he started the Mad Kurt thing, I think it's amazing. Seriously, I think it's amazing. And if I could choose uh, on my first match back who to have, I think the Dirty Day versus Mad Kurt feud could work really well. Uh, and, you know, I think it'd sell tickets. <laughs> Basically, I just do. Uh, I, and I, I look at Mad Kurt and I think that's a prime example of you can be a brilliant wrestler that I think he is. Honestly, I think he's one of the best guys that were a pro. But you just need that little gimmick sometimes to take you over the edge. Yeah, people are going to identify with a character more so than an ability. It's as simple as that. They're going to relate well, to what you do. What you said about Rev Pro, again, and I respect Rev Pro. They trained me. I am now where I am. I've got great opportunities for Rev Pro. So I'm being a bit careful what I say. Yeah. However, however, if you've got a trainee show or a bigger show, what have you, and I'm the sixth one on the card or fifth one on the card, if the first guy comes out and does a suicide dive and then the second and third match has a suicide dive, by the fourth or fifth match, you've seen suicide dives. Yeah. So you've either got to be a bigger or better one or even worse, you might be the sixth person doing a suicide dive and it might be crap compared to the first five. I'd never try and do stuff like that because it just wouldn't suit me. I, I, it's not that I wouldn't be able to do it. I'd do it and it would look the shit. So why bother? Yeah. You know, so I always think, yeah, well, I am different to rev pro um talk about the training is quite interesting because obviously early on it was dan mcgee rishi gosh rishi was really good when it came to character work i thought yeah. especially i think that was one of his strengths um and when he left rev pro it was a bit like my parents getting divorced i'd put it that way because yeah. <clears throat> i've always been i've always got on very well with andy boy simmons as well andy simmons uh although he's a can be a bit harder training and stuff like that it's all for good reason you know and it's all to, like, toughen you up a little bit, which you need in wrestling. Mm. So I always thought both of them, you had a good balance between character work and Andy, who had been out there, very good training. Again, very... he. I think Andy uh, Simmons got Dirty Dave. You know, he's booked me on lots of camp shows, which tells you he likes my character work. Um, Andy Quilden is, I would say, obviously, his main Rev Pro shows, you've got all the best wrestlers from the world there. So you're not just competing with Rev Pro, you're competing with the best wrestlers in the world from Japan, the Indies in America. So to get on one of his shows, you've got to be amazing at wrestling. And I'm not saying I don't think I should be on his shows, hmm. but I'm very much aware if he books me, it might be as a jobber or as a gimmick guy, um, which I do happily, but I don't think that's where I end. I think I could do something more than that. Again, you know, if you take some of the camp shows I've had, uh, the matches, watching back, uh, I had a really good couple of matches with Curtis, 20-minute matches on a camp show. Uh, I was lucky one day I, fan I uh, faced Johnny Storm on a camp show. I've seen the footage back of that. It was an amazing match, the best match I've ever had. Very, very easy. You know, the guy was easy to work with. And you look at that and you go, them matches could get on a Red Pro show, I think. But it's having the confidence of Andy Quilden to know that I won't go out there and stink the building up. And it's difficult because you're competing with everyone in the world, as I say. You know, there, there's no easy answer to it. So um, I think with Rev Pro, uh, what you've got to do is, you know, you've got to be a Rev Pro guy, one, you know, especially if you're coming out from the trainee camp. And as I say, you've got to go with what Andy Quilden wants, which is fine. What I think I need to do now at my age is get out there a bit and wrestle as many places as possible. Yeah. You know, and th there is a bit of politics in wrestling, unfortunately. Um, Ebenezer the geezer you had on not so long ago and he mentioned it he wanted me and him wanted to team up at one point it just never happened and it was around the time that Q wrestling started and Rev Pro and you could you, it felt like anyway from my point of view you couldn't be a Q guy and a Rev Pro guy you had to be one or the other and that's one of the reasons our tag team just didn't happen because you couldn't go it felt to both schools um without getting um I don't know, without getting a bit of a backlash, I think it's fair to say. Yeah. Do you, do you still think that's the case? Do you think that'll be the case when things go back to normal, that there'll still be a somewhat of a, not dissension, but, a, well, maybe, yeah, fuck it, dissension. Maybe there will be that kind of difference. Because like you say, like, I'm somebody who's trained at both schools, and I know a lot of guys around me, and obviously knowing Ebenezer the geezer so well, you know, there is that kind of 
you know, minimal backlash, attitude, a little bit of a kind of brazen way of looking at you as if to say, you know, okay, well, you've gone equality, um, so. It's, I know, and it's not me sitting on the fence. That's not me. But I can see both sides to this one. Hmm. So when you start getting, I'm a businessman. In the real world, I own a computer game shop. And if I employed someone and I showed them the ropes of my computer game shop, and then they opened a computer game shop a couple of miles away from me, would mm. I be happy? So I understand the business side to it. So uh, if a lot of guys leave RevPro and go to Q, that affects the financial side to it. So I can understand that sort of backlash. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think there was a couple of guys caught in the middle of that, which I am one, because as I've already said, I had a loyalty to Rishi because he helped train me. You know, mm. he, 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 he was my first ever singles match. Really got on with the guy, really do to this day. Um, but again, the Andes, understandably, weren't overly happy with it. So I chose to stay with RevPro mainly because the opportunity, you know, I want to shoot for the stars. Yeah. And I just felt RevPro, um, I'd rather be a small fish in a big pond than a big fish in a small pond, if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes total sense. That was my attitude at the time. Now I'm starting to think, should I go out there more? What more can I do? Um, but don't get me wrong, RevPro, as I say, I've had the opportunity to train with Doug Williams, uh, James, Mason, James Mason, Rhino, uh, New Japan the, from the LA Day Joe, them guys came down. So that's what Rev Pro can get you. And it does get you, and you, you'll get the best training, but you won't get model colleague there. You know, if you're not good, you'll get told you're not good. So it takes a strong mental attitude to do it. Yeah, it does. Um, Q, I think you could go there at any level and be comfortable. And it's very welcoming. I personally haven't been there because of the politics. Yeah. Um, and that's nothing to do. You know, I there's guys that go to Q that I get on really well with. There really is. Um, and in a perfect world, you would, you know, I'd be happy to go to both. But if that then stops you getting booked, it has a reverse effect. You know, you've you've got to choose where you think you're going. And another thing, Rev Pro, um, certainly until very recently, anyway. They also get a lot of camp show matches. And that's where my character particularly seems to get over a lot with the crowd on stuff like camp shows. Young audiences, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I don't dislike either. And I actually, I, I likened, I really enjoyed my training experience at Rev Pro because it taught me how to be a better athlete and be more physical and understand my conditioning better. When, you know, and then when I went to quality, it was more about, right, let's start showing you out a bit more. Let's see what right. kind of chops you've got, your promotions, your skills. Like, Let's see some of that podcast personality coming into the wrestling. And that. And like, for me, I don't really give two shits about people's fucking politics and their bollocks. Right. I don't. I care about my aspects. And the reason I'm interested in asking you is because of your age, like myself, an older guy wrestling, I think, personally, I've got far less tolerance for bollocks and bullshit. Yeah. And I have got to an age now where I think, well, you know, I'm 36, mate. I haven't got time to be messing around and dealing with your little squabbles. I don't care. I want to go somewhere where I'm going to be afforded the best opportunities that I want to express myself in. Surely, at your age, though, now, you must be thinking, like you say, you've kind of lent to it in that answer. You must be thinking, it's kind of time to take Dirty Dave Dennis everywhere, not just right. in that isolated area. Because I try yeah, you're not going I... to get Right, exactly. And it's one of them things. Um, I'm quite naturally a loyal guy. I just am. But when you're caught between a rock and a hard place, and I think a couple of us guys were that started on the Mondays and then didn't jump the queue, you've almost got to start at the bottom and prove to, to the guys at Rev Pro that you're worthy of being under the cards. Hmm. There's only so many spaces on the card. So if it gets to a point where you're not getting booked, you have to look elsewhere. Um, and as you rightly say, at my age, I've got a wife and kids to look after. So I'm at work all day. So then if I come to training and get involved in politics, it rubs me up the wrong way, naturally. And I, there's been a couple of occasions that I've had to bite my tongue. Um, because, look, as I said, there'll be guys starting after I started training with RevPro who are naturally better than me and rightly get on the card. I, what I need, personally, is to think that if I do well, there's a chance of getting on the main Rev Pro shows, you know? Hmm. And but, uh, the, the trainee shows, for example, you, you tell me, right? I, do the I go to the trainee shows, I wrestle on the trainee shows, yeah, I, I do the best I, I can and my ability. Uh, but that, doesn't, that hasn't, so far, led to me going to the next level. So if I can't break through the glass ceiling, 
then I have to go somewhere else. You know, it, it's, it's one of them things that, especially with this year out, it's really woken me up to, yeah. look, I've had a year out. For me, as you say, as you get older, that year means a lot. Yeah. You know? Um, so if I go to a training show, the last, the last training show I was on, I had the Dirty Dave Open Challenge, and I took on two guys making their debut. And the match wasn't amazing, but it got over, all right? You know, the crowd were into it, the two matches. The third time, I called Andy Simmons up. He rolls me up. He wins the belt off me. Watching the footage back, it got a great reaction. Absolute great reaction. It's a simple roll-up, but him winning the belt got a great reaction. Um, I'd like to think that would have led somewhere. But now, because everything that's happened in the world during lockdown, yeah. um, then obviously the way Rev Pro score is run is now different. You're not trying to impress the two Andys, you're trying to impress the one Andy. So if if Andy Simmons in my in was a good guy for booking me for character, and Andy Corden isn't such a character, he likes characters, but he likes five star matches. Mm. It's going to be very hard for me to do that. Um, and well, you tell me, what do you think of when I've been on training shows? I I get good feedback from the crowd, but it doesn't seem that that gets me anywhere. It's it's quite frustrating. There's a conversation I have with Ebenezer the Geezer, and as everybody knows, I've ruffled a lot of feathers on this podcast. I will continue to do so because I don't give you fake opinions. I give you my genuine opinions. Yeah, you which is nice to get. Is real or not. Um, me, personally, I would have you booked on more shows because I enjoy characters a lot more. And For instance, I've worked at CWP, which is a very character-heavy organisation, and because of that, I was afforded an opportunity because I'm a, I'm a berserker. You know, I'm 6'4", I'm 350 pounds. I'm, I'm a big lad. So for me, yeah. I look to guys like Vader and Bam Bam Figure like they're my inspiration they're the guys i want to be like and so for me uh i think that i'm a charismatic enough person in general life but in wrestling it was difficult for me to get over the anxieties and the issues involved with the mental hurdle because i'm not the person with the thickest skin in the room i'm the person who likes to look after everyone i'm everyone's big brother so for me i found that when I went to somewhere like CWP, I was afforded an opportunity to express myself and my charisma. And I don't feel like, you know, I don't think it's, a, I don't think Annie Kilden would disagree if he was sitting right here, that Dirty Dave Dennis has not had enough opportunities on the Rev Pro brand alone to express what kind of character he is. And I go to those shows at Buckland Community Center. I love those shows because they are, for me, grassroots wrestling. And I'm right, very I agree. grassroots football. You know, I'm a Lincoln City fan, have been my whole life. I like the dirty grimy pun intended nonsense yeah. <laughs> of what it you know what it entails i like that yeah. and i like to go into places like cw for instance i wrestled for the rather vaunted renegade you know and i liked that it was gritty it was a nightclub there's only 10 people in it there's no safety net there you either go out there and do something or you look like a piece of crap and exactly. yeah so for me yeah dave dennis should be on better shows but at the same time you're an old enough man to understand this do you feel that it's up to you to almost break away from your sense of loyalty to that brand to become what you, um, you want to be yeah um it's different there's a story about which is why i got onto the last buckland show mm. so the very last buckland show it actually had a couple of guys from new japan on there yeah you know piccolo, um, piccolo was there and, you know, I got to wrestle uh, last year on a camp show, believe it or not, the Great Okan. I was a baby face and he was a heel, which was cool. But this is what Red Pro can get you, you know, you, you get yeah. to get them sort of opportunities. However, there were, what a lot of people don't know, there was a guy in the crowd that night called Scott Conway. He's a wrestling promoter that has just come back from Thailand. He's been there years. And I got a bit of feedback from him that I was the one guy that stood out to him on the show. Hmm. So stuff like that, you think, Wow, if, a, if, if someone with fresh eyes almost can see that, sometimes I think people that see you training day after day after day, because they see your flaws as well as your positives, they almost concentrate on your flaws more than your positives. Yeah. And it's a bit like the Paul Heyman thing with ECW. You, you want to take people's positives and push that to the moon. And if they're not, you know, as I said, I'm not bad in the ring, but I'm not a five-star wrestler, but that's not the sign of, sort of match I should have anyway, obviously, to me. So if Scott Conway starts doing shows again, I'm in contact with him. Hopefully that's another opportunity for me. Hmm. He, he books guys like Flatliner. And Flatliner's a, a, the sort of guy, right? He's not the most popular guy with certain circles of wrestling. But I watched him. I was I doing a show one. And I was, do, yeah, I was doing the music for this show. And I'm watching. It was in Petersfield. And I'm at the top doing the music. So I wasn't booked, but I was, okay, fine. I was doing the music. 
And there was a lot of guys that had decent matches. Flatliner came out there and the crowd erupted all the way through. He had the crowd eating out the palm of his hands. So whether you like the guy personally or not, you have to say he's one of the few guys the fans would remember after the show. And I'd put myself in that bracket. I may not be the best wrestler, but I think if kids come out of the show talking about me or flossing or what have you, I've done my job. And I can't see why that wouldn't work on a bigger scale. I just think you need the opportunity to do that on a bigger scale. I, I've been thinking about it quite a lot. And cut me off if I'm rabbiting on. Carry on, man. But, uh, you know, I don't know if you've ever done it. But as you say, you compare yourself to Vader or some bigger guys. I was trying to think, who do I compare with in WWE recently? And weirdly, I thought someone like Enzo Amore. Mm. Now, everyone backstage hated Enzo Amore, apparently, right? Yeah. And couldn't understand why he was even wrestling for WWE. But when he came out, the crowd always reacted to him. Yeah. Always. Didn't have the best matches, but they always were. He was the second biggest merchandise seller for WWE behind John Cena. So he must be doing something right. So everyone can criticise his matches or whatever else, but truth be told, if the fans are into him, isn't that the whole point, point of wrestling? You know, I, I've, I've got thick skin. I can take a negative feedback. Uh, I, I had one match, the biggest match I've ever had, uh, it felt personally for me versus Priscilla in a hair versus hair match. Mm. And um, I'll, I'll be first to admit, I was quite nervous before the match. My, my main thing when it comes to wrestling, actually, probably because of age, is my memory. So we had a long match planned out with loads of different spots. It went OK, but maybe it could have gone better. Maybe it could have been shorter. <clears throat> and the, the feedback I got from that was mainly negative. But when I spoke to people who watched it live, the feedback was mainly positive. So it depends how you're watching, I always say, a match. If you're watching it to pick out the bad parts, maybe you're missing the good parts. You know, it's just one of them things. One of the biggest critiques I had of Rev Pro, and I've I actually covered so many Rev Pro shows, and I got on with so many guys, and I was of the opinion certain people weren't getting pushed that should have been, and other people were getting pushed, rightfully so, but the problem was that they were very similar. So you right, would correct. have three or four matches that, that were the same, and you were like, okay, that's great. For instance, the Portsmouth Guild Hall shows, Rishi's matches would always get a larger response in part because yeah. of the local legend status, same like Flatliner as well, but also in part because he would talk to an audience. He would use his perception and convey his character to an audience. So they're far more perceptive of that material than they are of the guy who can execute the perfect armbar because, yeah, that's great, but a wrestling fan in general, and especially a family-orientated show, isn't going to relate yeah. to that manoeuvre more. I love Curtis Chapman. He's one of my yeah. favourite people, and he used to give us technical clinics, and I thought he was a joy to be around. And you could always tell yeah. he had much more charisma. And... Yeah. You know, he'd go out there and it, people would just boo him or whatever because, again, he's another, you know, the joke was avant-garde tribute of Zack Sabre Jr. So, fine. That's, yeah. that's not a bad thing to be, to be honest. I wish I could wrestle that beautifully. Yeah, I agree. But at the same but time, I, the problem it's, it's, for me is I look at Dirty Dave Dennis and I think, no offence, but you want it how it is. You're not going to get the opportunities to be there because Rev Pro is very much about, like you say, five-star athleticism. And because it's backed by a giant like NJPW, and I don't think these are critiques. I think this is just standard honesty for anyone who opens their eyes and looks at it. It's always going to lean towards, right, we need that very serious, very powerful, very technically efficient, because one day they want these guys to be able to get in there with Kushida or an Akada well, or Minara Suzuki. And they don't look at Dirty Dave, Dave, Dave Dennis and probably think that guy could wrestle Minara Suzuki. Me personally, I'd love to see it because I think the clash and dichotomy of comedic well, and serious would be I, I wish, for example, so I was booked on a holiday camp show and the, there was only four of us on the show and it was Hikaleu, the great O'Khan, Andy Boy Simmons and Dirty Dave Dennis. Yeah. And there was hardly anyone watching because they hadn't advertised a wrestling that day. And... um. So they had to put the wrestling on instead of bingo, which wasn't the main audience we want. Um, so, as I say, it was one of them things. Andy went out there with Hikaleu. The crowd was into it to an extent, but you got the feeling it just wasn't going to happen. Uh, me and Oka went out there, the great Okan, and he pulled me out the merchant. I was selling merchandise and he'd done an open challenge. I come out as babyface, not Dirty Dave, but just you know, babyface that Dave Dennis. Hmm. When we was planning the match, I remember saying to Oka, and he was very generous. You know, he should have been playing the whole match. He said, what do I want to do? 
And I remember thinking Hulk Hogan, Andre the Giant. Mm. And the whole offense was, I get a little bit on him, go for the body slam. He cuts me off, beats me up, beats me up. I get a little bit of a comeback, get him up for the second slam, fall on my back. One, two, he gets the close pin. By the end of it, uh, I don't know, he missed the move. I got a little comeback. I got him with a body slam and the crowd popped for a body slam. because I'd failed twice, got him the third time. The crowd popped for it, you know, and then he cut me off and won the match. But the point is with that, simple stuff still works in wrestling. It just yeah. does. It doesn't stop working. And as you rightly say, I don't think... So Curtis could go out there and have a, cl a clinic, a brilliant technical match, brilliant technical match. Or, depending on the crowd, he could go out and do his Mad Kurt stuff. And Mad Kurt might get much more over and has done than yeah. Curtis Chapman. I think you do need both. My point is, I'm the first to admit that people like that are way better wrestlers than me. They've been wrestling longer than me. And they're better than I'll probably ever be. But I think sometimes with company, with guys at Red Pro, they've got more to show. I mean, one of the guys I'd point out, personally, uh, that I get on with is Louis, Kenneth Halfpenny, right? right. I think he yeah. really helped me in the beginner sessions as well. He, he was always there with Dan McGee doing tech. Him and Dan, brilliant. Can't put them over enough. And he's on the main card now. And seeing him in training, he's amazing. Absolutely yeah. amazing. But the one thing he's not doing now is some of his character stuff. That's almost been dropped for the time being. He could come back to it, but in the contenders division, that's been dropped. So that's all to do with personal taste. I think you shouldn't have to sacrifice one to get the other. Mm. I think you could put him on as his character and he'd soon get over for being both, for being a good wrestler and technical. Um, but as you rightly say, with Rev Pro, you, you, you've got the Rev Pro audience, but that's not to say someone like me couldn't get over. I've got enough confidence to think it would work. And during lockdown was an interesting one because Rev Pro has still been running uh, shows with no crowd. Mm. And to me, again, you know, it's up to Andy Quinn and he could book who he wants and rightly so, it's his company. But I was thinking, hang on, I've got the dirty 24-7 title. This is something where you can't have fans. Surely having the dirty 24-7 title and it was skits for it would be yeah. perfect. Because it's yeah. it's something you could do that's different. They could be slotted. Exactly. Them, exactly. It's something different. It's something completely different that could take up five minutes of your show. And that's how you'd get someone like me over while you can't have a crowd. And then when I come out in front of a crowd, even if a wrestler comes out and, and I job out, there's ways of getting over for people like me. And I just know it. My thing is, as you rightly said with the age, is if I was 10 years younger, I think, no, I'm going to carry on, carry on. I, I've, I'm going to carry on wrestling, but I'll wrestle wherever will book me now. And I, 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 I want the bookings. I'm getting a bit frustrated, actually, with seeing all the wrestling posters come out of people that I know are less experienced than me mm. or, or, or maybe better wrestling, but aren't um, as entertaining as me. And they're getting booked. I've emailed lots of promoters and some just don't get back to you. And without being harsh, I think that's really rude. I only shop if someone messages me, I'll message them back. Yeah. But even if it's a CV, I message them back. Um, so I, I think it's interesting because in wrestling, it is so political now. And as I say, I'm in a situation where I genuinely like training with Rev Pro. I appreciate what they've done for me. Do you know what I mean? Um, but if they're not going to book me on the main shows, I, I have to get booked somewhere else. Because by the time I'm 45, 50, I'm going to look back going, why didn't I try somewhere else? Yeah. And, and you know, as I say, uh, Rishi was my debut match. I watched that back very fondly. We, we went... A couple of years ago, we watched it. We, we, a lot of us went out, loads of the Q guys, and there was, I think, two guys, me and one other guy from Red Pro there, um, that all met up, that all got on. And we watched Fighting With Your Family, the premiere, which was really cool. And I chatted to him a bit there, and he was saying, you know, he was very proud of the match we had as a debut match because it was something, you know, he got my character over and I got his character over. And I do feel I can get other people over as well. It's not just me I can get over, I can get other people over. But if you're not booked, that ain't going to happen. You know, you need the opportunity to do that. And uh, as I say, it, it's one of them things that if, if you, if, uh, again, I'm being a bit careful what I say, but if a certain promoter doesn't like the way you wrestle, well, I can't do moonsaults. I'm not, I, I'm not very good at suicide dives. Mm. So if you look at other 
places booking bigger characters, it almost, it, it seems a no brainer. I have to go there. And not training necessarily, but go there to wrestle, certainly. But obviously, now with Q and Red Pro, the chance of getting booked without training there is nearly impossible. So Rev Pro, let's be honest, aren't going to go to Q and book a load of guys. And it's the same the other way. Q won't book a load of Rev Pro guys because they'll push their own guys, and rightly so. Uh, but that also then has an effect when Q have deals with other companies as well, you know, mm. uh, with Chris K and guys like that. And so, you know, you almost have to get out there, and I feel I have to now, and some of it is my fault for not doing it sooner, and message these guys going, look, please give me a chance. You know, without begging too hard, like, please watch what I can do. Because I think if you booked me, you'd be happy with what I can do. You know, it, it, it's a hard one. I for, I've personally found it hard just to break that glass ceiling. I, I don't know why. And a bit like Dexter, you know, but Ebenezer said, you know, there's certain guys, as soon as Dexter started training, I loved his gimmick immediately. Mm. You know, he's a guy I would book 100%. And I thought, teamed up as the Dirty Geezers, right? We could have been you know, maybe like a Too Cool or something when they first started, you know? Yeah. But they, you know, the thing about Too Cool, people forget Scotty Too Hotty Scotty Too doing The Worm very much got over with the mass audience. Now, why couldn't me and Dex get over? And now what Rev Pro done, uh, and it was to get me on the card, so I can't argue, they teamed me with Simon. And Simon is genuinely one of my best mates in wrestling such a super super nice guy but it felt like we was forced together because they had nothing for either one of us mm. if that makes sense you know so there you go you'll get booked in a tag team match but every tag team match we've ever had we've jobbed out so if you're jobbing out time after time you're educating the fan that you are going to be a jobber so I'd, I'd i'd have the thing of wrestling on a camp show with um mad kurt having a 20 minute match and Curtis coming back and you've done really well or wrestling the great O'Khan, do you know what I mean? Or wrestling Andy Boy Simmons, you know, who I loved wrestling, very easy to wrestle, super, super nice guy. I can't say enough about him. And I'll go from that to going to a trainee show and getting in there with someone making their debut and jobbing out to them, which I don't mind. But if that's every time, will the crowd just give up on me? Mm. And maybe that's me taking it too seriously, but that's, that's how it feels. Yeah, but you also have to take it more seriously because of your age. Same as me. Yeah. I I had made a very conscientious decision very early that I was going to do what was best for me. And that ruffled feathers in both camps, actually. And I was fine yeah. with that because ultimately, I always say to the younger lads, because I'm lucky, I'm friends with a lot of them. And I like I say, big brother effect. And I always say to them, don't forget that you train, you pay to be trained. You don't pay to be loyal to that company. I, personally, I'm, you know, I admire you for showing loyalty. Me, I don't give a fuck about my loyalty to companies. I give a fuck about the loyalty to myself because when it comes down to it, I'm the one who pays my hard-earned money that I work incredibly hard for to be taught how to wrestle, not to be right. taught how to love somebody. Don't need to yeah. do that. I have people at home that I love. Thank you very much. I, 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 I do, you do see people in wrestling, naming no names, that suck up to certain promoters. And you see that all the time. And I, that's just not me. That's just not me. To me, if I go out there and the crowd reacts to me, that should say more. And we go back. To, yeah, maybe. I mean, I'll go back to, as I said, I was in a rumble where I'd done the floss and the crowd were doing it well. I remember listening to a podcast, the A Square, Square Circle podcast that the two Andys were doing at the time. And I think Andy Simmons was in America or Japan or somewhere when they were doing it. So he wasn't there. And Andy Quilden said, my favourite part of the whole event was Dirty Dave doing the floss. So that's Andy Quilden saying that. And mm. at the next training session, he pulled me just one side, really like your attention to detail. Um, and I thought, good, we're going somewhere. And from then, nothing happened. I remember for the next four Sundays in a row, and bear in mind, I work six days a week. Sunday's my only day off for my wife and kids. Mm. I, my wife gave me grief because the four Sundays in a row, I was training with Doug Williams. It cost me a hundred quid, which I love training with Doug Williams. I knew it was Right. The, the next Sunday after that was a show in London for Rev Pro. And, you know, I asked, do you want me to come along? And I was basically snubbed, it felt. Like, we don't really need people helping out. We've got enough guys. So I thought, well, how have I gone from someone that you know is going to entertain the crowd to zero? It, and whether I'd done something in that time or ruffled the feathers or done something wrong, I don't know. But there's only so many times that you can hear you've done a good job 
and then not get booked before you do wonder what's going on. Is it a personality thing? I, in general, like to think. Um, I know when I first started wrestling, because hmm. my character work, some people took me the wrong ways. Uh, wrong way. I remember when I first started going to Wednesday, and I got in the ring with a couple of people, and I was giving them shit in the ring, in training. And they thought, who's this dickhead? Not realise it's my character. Yeah. It's not real. If I do a promo on someone, I remember I'd done a promo on a guy and he got really offended by it. To the point he was messaging me upset that I'd slagged him off. And I thought, it's a promo. I mean, the guy I'm talking about very recently has died. So I'm being very careful not to say anything negative about him personally. He had his own demons. But I remember doing a promo about him and him getting ultra offended. And to me, if, you do, if you're doing a promo to me, say what the fuck you want. It's a promo. I want people to think you want to kick my head in and yeah. I'm going to kick your head in and people might buy a ticket We pay to watch it. That's the point of wrestling. So if, if I can sell a ticket, if people will watch me wrestle and buy a ticket to see me, like you said, you know, you were sent the same by me. Why wouldn't I be booked? I'd pay for myself in that sense. And from a business point of view, I can't understand um, some of them reasons. As I said, so after listening to that podcast, you know, my, my confidence, you know, that I was the best thing on the show or very entertaining was a million percent. Then getting snubbed for the London show just to help out, my confidence went to zero. And as you know, with wrestling, a lot of it is confidence. Yeah. So you think, well, what have I done wrong? It's a horrible feeling. And I, 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 to be fair, um, Andy Quilden, when he's running these shows, has a lot to think about. He's got a lot on his mind. And a lot of the times I might have disturbed him when he was on the phone or busy. Maybe I just got the timing wrong. I don't know. But to, I was always thought, you know, I'm a grown man. If I don't, if I want to come to London, I'll just ask a guy in charge. But maybe that's not the way it's done. Maybe you have to go through someone else. I'm not, I don't know. I'm not good at the political bullshit. I'm not. I just think if I'm there, I can help out the show. I, I was helping out in a Guild Hall show, uh, a show in Portsmouth, Guild Hall show. And I was helping do the merchandise. And I would bet I sold more merchandise than the other three people do merch together. But again, nothing got mentioned about that. And I, it's certain things that you think I am an asset to have. I know I am, even from a business point of view, but that's not getting used. And for a grown man to feel that way, as I say, with wife and kids at home, I, I do feel now that, as I said, I don't want to look back thinking, why didn't I try harder? So, as I said, if anyone listening to this, if you're a promoter and you want to book me, ping me a message. I'm more than happy to wrestle, whether it's Kapow, whether, you know, Outcast wrestling, wrestling um, varied, ve I've heard varied things about Outcast. I was going to ask you about Outcast because it's your local promotion. Well, funny enough, right, so there's a lot of people that knock Outcast, okay? And the, f the thing is, uh, Matt Jackson, who runs Outcast and owns Outcast, I only got to know him when he came to my shop asking to put a poster up. I was like, fuck a wrestling school opening on the Isle of Wight. I, I was in two minds. Again, good idea. Business-wise, hmm. is there enough people on the Isle of Wight to make it pay? And initially, he got a lot of guys from the mainland, a lot of Red Pro guys, down for outcast. And he's cut that back, I assume, to save money. Because, obviously, it's yeah. expensive to bring people over. Especially if you're drawing 100, 150 people, it's hard to make it pay. Um, but it's one of them things. I'm happy to wrestle there. For me, it's a nice, easy booking. Without being rude, I can work all day finish my job, drive 10 miles up the road, get paid to wrestle and come home again. Perfect. No late night. You know, I'm home by 11, which for wrestling is nothing. Yeah. Um, with Outcast, they've got some really, yeah, they've got some good guys there, but they've got some guys that aren't ready yet as well. It's a mix. And I think Matt would admit that, admit that himself. Um, and that's a tricky one because Matt, again, like anywhere else, can teach him what he knows, but he can't teach him what he doesn't know. So, so for me personally, with Red Pro, as I said before, that's why I love training with um, someone different, whether it's Johnny and Jody when they're over, Doug Williams, because they'll teach, like James Mason was interesting. I was in the ring with little Dan, uh, who's just left Red Pro, unfortunately. But I was in the ring with him and James Mason actually called other guys over and went, look what they're doing, it's really good. And again, it was the whole fresh eyes. Someone looking with fresh eyes will see something someone else won't. So people might knock Outcast or Kapow or anything like that. But if the fans like it, can it be that wrong? If the fans are going away happy, who are we to knock it? I honestly believe there's a lot of snobbery in wrestling. And actually, it annoys me. Because why should, why, if, the, if the fans are happy, what right have we got to be snobby? It's wrong. 
the snobbery really relates a lot to the style of wrestling as opposed to what you can offer. For instance, there are I know so, I know so many guys. I don't name drop people; they can speak for themselves. But the podcast has really afforded me an opportunity to meet amazing, amazing amount of people across the pond and everything. And one of the main things that people say is because I'm not as technically proficient or because I'm more character based. And on the flip side, some people who are so character based but can't do very simple things like rolls up and you know, they think, yeah. okay, well, you know, I can't get on shows for whatever reason. But for me, like, you know, me and Dexter have spoken so much about this. I want this brand to be big enough to a point where I can almost adapt it to be like a WCPW sort of thing where I can run my own shows. And I'm much more interested in what the people want than what the wrestlers want and pe- that, that upsets people and I don't care because I, ultimately I'm going to pay you as a wrestler to perform but at the top yeah. of the card and the most important thing is the people paying to come and see it and yeah. you know you want to feel you want to make everyone out there feel the same way that you felt when you were young when you were a fan when you were sat right. in the- Yes, when you were sat in that cheap seat or whatever it was and one of the reasons that really drew me to Rev Pro was first of all it's local which is very cool you're very blessed if you live in a Portsmouth area like I do because yep. your options but you know I remember going like when I first started going it was guys like Flatliner and Johnny Storm and people who were exceptionally charismatic and entertaining and I love technical wrestling I do I watch New Japan fluidly and i really enjoy it but even there like for instance with the new japan crossover first thing that came to mind with me was dirty dave dennis toriano books itself easy money as far as i'm concerned um you can be able to write it it'd just be good fun it'd just be good fun but i can spend hours obviously sitting here talking to you about that but something i do want to talk about moving it not necessarily moving away because it's your podcast you can talk for whatever you want but something i want to touch on before we get close to the end is uh the cameos because i love those <laughs> i love the fact that yeah but do you know what i love about those that's self-investment you've gone out yeah. there and said to people whether people like you or not and i can understand why some people might be rubbed up the wrong way from you because ultimately they can't separate the character from the human being they can't great. yeah i know but at the same and personally, I don't give a shit. It's not like you've upset me. And if you come for me, you'll, you'll get it back tenfold, simple as. But the cameos are great fun. And like I said, self-investment. I love the fact that you've identified who you are and you realize that you can genuinely believe that you can make money from that. So you've gone out and invested in cameos. You've got famous personalities, wrestlers, that you've used that platform to get them to call you out. And it's gained traction. And because of that, you've actually got a decent social media presence, a lot more than, you know, guys who do a lot more than you in the business. You know, I've I've just spoken to Joe Lando, for instance, probably one of the most insane high flyers in the business. And yeah, he's probably got about the same social media following as you do, which shows it's not always necessarily about being a great athlete. It's about how you can draw people in. Talk to me about the cameos. Tell me about them. Yeah, the, the cameos, um, I, they do rub some people up the wrong way. I've had a bit of flack for them, which I really? find amazing. I because them. I They're work hard for a living. Way. Well, I work hard for a living. It's my money. And if I want to invest in my character, hmm. why shouldn't I? I can never... There was a guy. I'll call him out. His name's Connor, okay? Uh, he used to tr- wrestle with Rev Pro. He went on Twitter and slagged me off personally. He, oh, he right. literally put out a tweet saying... If how would how would why is he wasting his money on that he's got from the government for his shop being closed? Shouldn't he be feeding his kids instead and shit like that? Which really offended me. Yeah, I well, don't really know this fucking idiot, right? So what I went, I went on Facebook. I put a picture of him going, "What a knobhead!" He gets his girlfriend to message me, begging him to take it down, right? Now this is a guy that for no reason has got offended by the cameos. Nothing to do with him. I don't know the guy. Now, the cameos, the whole point of them from day one was to entertain people, okay? It's to get my name out there. There's mm. no wrestling on. So it's all done by social media during lockdown. They're an easy way. So I haven't... When Rhino was over, I had a training seminar with Rhino. We'd done a little skit afterwards where Rhino took the belt off me, which is lovely, okay? Mm. And that got quite a few, few views. And that was my first thought of, hang on, this sort of idea could work. And... It's interesting. Some of the people that slagged off the cameos are now doing similar things themselves, um, ironically. Uh, and the whole, again, with the cameos, the most viewed one at the moment on YouTube is Sooty and Sweep. Sooty and Sweep, right? Nothing to do with wrestling. But that, it's a whole crossover appeal. 
back in the olden days, well, not the olden days, when I was young, you know, I'm quite old, Big Daddy used to get on kids' TV. So Big Daddy was on Tiswas and shit like that, okay? Right. Nowadays, even the most famous wrestler in Britain could walk down the street and no one knows who the fuck he is. Yeah. Okay? Big Daddy was never the best wrestler, but he sold a lot of tickets. Him and Giant Haystack sold out Wembley uh, Arena, you know? And I just looked at that and I thought, well, actually, isn't that the point? You can be famous in the wrestling bubble or you can get out there and do more. You know, and with the cameos, right? Even if they cost me money, it's my money. And if it's entertaining people, what the hell? I, I, I don't care. You know, if I can afford to do it, and actually the way I could afford doing it is I wasn't spending money going training. Every time I go training, because the boat fare, it's cost me 40, 50 quid a time. Yeah, people forget so instead how expensive of, it is. <laughs> yeah, and it's not the training itself that's expensive. Don't get me wrong. It's the oh, journey it's time bad. and everything like yeah. that. Um. So if I'm using that money to up my social media presence and stuff like that, I don't have an issue with it. I can, I can understand some people thinking, who the fuck does this guy think he is? But from day one, I can honestly say it was meant to be tongue in cheek. It was never meant to be overly serious. It was meant to be entertaining. Some of the, some of the celebrities I've got were purposely z list, like Lisa from Big Brother and stuff. She was like a tenor, do you know what I mean? But for me, it's a z list celebrity. Give me a shout out. Who cares? You know, I had some per- the woman from Gogglebox who now is friends with me on Facebook. Do you know what I mean? And I'm like, if I could get her, a, a bird from Gogglebox, onto a wrestling show, the crowd would pop. The crowd would pop for that. Because yeah. it's silly shit that suits my gimmick. Someone out there challenging me for the dirty 24-7 title works for my gimmick. If Mick Foley will do a video for me and he's happy with it and I'm happy with it, and he's challenging me for the belt, does that help next time I'm defending the title on a show? So if someone advertised that I'm defending this versus a mystery opponent, if a couple of people buy tickets thinking it might be Rhino, it might be McFoley, what harm does that do? The promoter's the one who's laughing. He's got an open goal because he can bring out a legend people haven't seen for years. He could bring out a newbie. He could bring out a dog or cat or mouse or rabbit. I don't care. And, you know, pin me for the belt. And for me, it was a way of getting my name out there. And as you say, if, I've, if I'm getting views online, I cannot see a negative side to that. I can see how some people are offended, but as you say, I don't really give a fuck about the people that are offended. Some of them don't even know me. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, it's not for me to say what people are offended by, but my friend Nick always has the very famous phrase of offences taken, not given, which I've always kept with me. And uh, I, I don't have a problem with people being offended, but at the same time, get over it. <laughs> you, know, you can't be offended forever. And... Not only that, wrestling isn't real. People have to remember wrestling. If the biggest company in the world is called World Wrestling Entertainment. Yeah. Not I mean, World Wrestling Entertainment. on that program right now. So. Right. And from what I understand, he's shifting a load of merchandise. He is. He's number one merch, though. And people knock WWE all the time. You hear people, New Japan's great, WWE. Vince McMahon is a billionaire. He must be doing something right. You know, and as we said before, some of the guys he's pushed in the past, Hacksaw, Jim Duggan and stuff like that. What a great character. Mm. Always got the crowd going. Very simple as well. That's it. You... You don't need to have a 20 minute master. He's got a flag and he's shouting ho. That's it. There's nothing too in depth about it. In fact, the only time that he started failing was when he went to WCW and then they tried to make it too in depth by giving him Irish backgrounds and dumb shit like that. And And they change it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But the the point is uh, exactly what I said before. In my mind, a promoter, if I was a promoter, which I'm not, and would I be a promoter in years to come? I'd love to be. Whether I would or not, I don't know. Physically do it, but I'd love to do it. I always think you look at a guy, maybe like a Curtis Chapman or a Dan McGee or me or Rob the Gob or any of these guys, and you know what they're good at, Mm. okay? And you push to what is good. As I said, like Paul Heyman done. You wouldn't book me in a 20-minute technical masterclass. You just wouldn't. Or if you did, you're doomed to failure because it's never going to be as good as some of the other masterclasses you've seen before. But if you just book me in a 10-minute match that we can chuck together, it's going to be entertaining, which is all, you know, as, as I say, if someone wants to book me, I'll do always, always do my best to entertain the crowd. And I don't see that's how that's negative. I really don't. Yeah. Um, as we reach the hour point, uh, would you mind coming back on? Do you want to come back? No, on? that's fine, mate. 
Awesome. I'd, I'd love to have you back on uh, a few more times at least. I always offer that to everybody, but I genuinely feel like there's a lot more for you to say. And there's also a lot more for you to shine, but I wanted to afford you the last bit of this podcast as an opportunity um, to sell yourself and also to speak to prospective promoters because I imagine a few will tune into this and they'll be like, Dave, Dave Dennis, that's somebody different. Oh, this is a cameo guy for whatever reason. But you, for me, genuinely, I mean, I'll be honest with you, mate. I don't have people on here unless, well, everyone I have on here, I make sure that they have a platform and I also make sure that we promote them, not ourselves, because I don't give a fuck right. about that. You know, I make my money elsewhere. Um, so, as far as I'm concerned, I want people to know what Dirty Dave Dennis is about. So here's your pitch. Here's your promotion. Sell people on you, the character, the individual, and what you can offer to their promotion. Simple. Okay. Quite simply, I think I am different. I think one of my strengths is engaging with the audience. And it doesn't have to be a young audience. I think I can do it with an older audience as well. And I think in wrestling today, a lot of people forget about the crowd. A lot of people, as we said before, have masterclasses. I think if I'm booked on a show, I'll always do my all, but I put a lot of thought into it. I'll sit up the night before thinking, what can we do? What can we do? And if I'm booked on a show, I'll always want people to go away. Maybe it's a bit arrogant, talking about me or Dirty Dave or that guy with the belt. Hmm. And it's one of the things, I think if I'm a promoter, I'd look at someone like me, honestly, and I've got the Dirty 24-7 title. I think it's an own goal for most promoters. You could book me on a show, doing an open challenge and as i said if they want me to put their local guy over i'm happy to do it so in a way even if you use me for a one-shot deal i'd be happy with that you know as i said before i I, i'm not arrogant enough to think i should be world champion anywhere but i think i can add entertainment to any show and literally any show there's no limit to it i I, as i said before you look at enzo amore in wwe it worked for him and I, I would beg any promoter to go back and watch some of Enzo Amore's matches and the crowd reaction, the crowd reaction to what he does. And it's the same. One of the things I do, my finishing move, I use rock bottom on people's elbow. Why? The crowd know what it is. Simple but effective. You don't have to change a win- winning formula. And as I said, I'm not the youngest guy they can book. But I think if you put me with a promotion, I can certainly add and maybe help the young guys out with stuff they haven't thought about before, character-wise. Because there might be guys that are 20, 21, that they've got, who are amazing wrestlers, but for whatever reason aren't quite connecting with the crowd. I think if you book me with them, they might see another side, because I think I could get their personality over as well. So that's what I'd say my strengths are. I, I think character and personality, I could get other people over as well. And I think that's as good a reason to book me as anything else, if I'm honest. Yeah, I, I also really, really admire the fact that you're willing to say on a public platform, this is what I can do. And I deserve opportunities to prove what I can do. Not that I will just go out there and do it. I just want opportunities. To well, not only that, I'll be honest, as I said, as I said before, I'll be honest, how I feel at the moment is very frustrated. Yeah, very yeah. frustrated. Because yeah. I can't go on Facebook without seeing people booked on shows that I think I could do a better job, not a better match necessarily, but a better job than them. Mm. And I think that's important. You know, if you've got, as we said before, seven matches on a card, you don't need seven five-star matches. Because at some point, people got to go for a piss or people want to go and get a drink. Now, I'm not saying I should be the drink and piss break. I'm not saying that. But I do think I can mix up the card a little bit. I really do. I think the stuff like the flossing. And I'd like to say, by the way, I kept on saying I'm not great in the ring. I don't believe that either. I think I can have a good match. I have had good matches. But I just need the opportunity to prove what I can do. You know? And I just think, if I went out there and had a five-star match, but you've had five other five-star matches, people wouldn't remember me. If Mm. I go out there and I'm I'm entertaining, people will remember. And that is, as I say, my frustration. I just need the opportunity to get my foot in the door. And... I, I, for whatever reason, I don't even know why, it feels like sometimes I'm banging my head against a brick wall. And, you know, um, I don't know why is the honest answer. I think some of it is political. Some of it, I might be a threat. I do believe that. I remember in the real world, I once, I'm, I used to be a chef. And I got employed by, as a second chef. And I was so much better than the head chef. That head chef sacked me. Sacked me. 
And it, it taught me a lesson in life. Sometimes you're a threat. Sometimes if someone who's in charge of booking you knows that, look, independently, I own my own game shop. You know, I, I could start a company if I wanted to. Is it some small promoters are a bit worried about booking me in case I might go, oh, I'll nickel your guys. I'll do. It's nothing like that. I'm not looking to do anything. But I just wonder sometimes if there is a factor, being an older guy, that they think I won't be pushed around or I won't be happy with a £10 payoff for the day. Because again, I wouldn't ask silly money, but I'd ask what I think is a fair payoff for a day's work. And that includes helping with the ring before and after, helping shift merchandise, which I think stuff like, my dirty day hats I've had done. Now that might rind people up the wrong way, but people have brought them. You know, people have brought them. So if I could sell merchandise at a show and the promoter takes a cut, that's another form of income for them. You know, wrestling is a business. And I think sometimes wrestlers, promoters, especially forget that it's a business. And I'm what I'm trying to put over is the fact that it makes business sense for me to wrestle for them, I feel. Like I say, um, you know, I'd like to, you know, look at some of the positive aspects of you and closing out the show. Obviously, people are going to want to be able to engage with you personally. They're going to want to see these cameos for themselves. Obviously, we'll try and provide a few clips and stuff on this YouTube video, which you've probably seen of, you know, Dirty Dave Wrestling and stuff like that. Obviously, copyright and whatnot permitting. But um, where can people find you if they want to speak to you via social media? Brilliant. So Twitter, uh, Dirty Dave Dennis. Mm -hmm. uh, just that. Whack Dirty Dave Dennis into Facebook. I'll come up on there, like my Facebook page. Uh, Instagram, again, Dirty Dave Dennis, nice and simple. You'll see it on there. Just like the page. I'm happy to interact with anyone, fans, promoters, anyone really, anyone, even if it's young guys getting into it that want a bit of advice. And I'm not saying all my advice will be right, but it'll be my honest opinion. And that's all I can put across, really. Um, and, and again, you know, I, I'd love to interact more with everyone. You know, yeah. I love wrestling, I always have. Uh, you know, I've watched it since I was very, very young. And I, I think what we just said is right. People have different attitudes towards wrestling as they do in life. But it doesn't mean someone's right or wrong. It just means they've got a different opinion. And with wrestling, I think it just needs to open up that bit. And people start talking a bit more about it. Put it that way. Yeah. Uh, finally, as well, obviously, you're a personal business owner. I take that very seriously as an independent artist myself. Um, can people still interact with your business? Where can they find your business? Uh, if you've yeah. still got online sales and that, obviously, you know, it's important you promote your personal life as well. Cool. Yeah, it feeds me. <laughs> Wrestling has never fed me yet. No. Um, if you type in Arcade Games Isle of White or Arcade Games Shanklin into Google, You'll find the shop Facebook page. Give that a like. I'm here every day putting stock on there. I'm posting out anywhere in the UK. Um, and again, if there's stuff you want, you know, have I got any Mega Drive games or what have you, give me a shout. I, I The other day I went, I was going for my VHSs and I still have in stock about 500 WWF VHSs and some WCW stuff. So even if it's stuff you think I might not have, give me a shout. I might have it. And uh, again, like with everything else, I'd appreciate any sale possible because like everyone else at the moment really hard time of it i need to pay the bills <laughs> like everyone else yeah no i no, appreciate the honesty mate and all the uh links uh will be available obviously in the descriptions of these podcasts so check them out via the youtube subscription and of course on the podcast descriptions as well dirty dave dennis it's been a, a very thrilling conversation actually it's been quite refreshing it's uh, definitely not been the norm and i'm very thankful for that so thank you for joining me on the podcast mate Cheers, mate. Yeah, thank you very much. Cheers, My mate. pleasure. Look after yourself, brother. Take care, mate. Yeah, you too. Thank you very thank much, you, mate. Man.